In Dungeons & Dragons' classic post-apocalyptic setting, the despotic sorcerers who destroyed the world still rule over the shattered lands their greed left behind. This isn't D&D as we know it. Just as every classic D&D game begins in a tavern, every Dark Sun game begins in the arena. Dark Sun Shattered Lands came out in the wake of the Gold Box engine, a topic we have discussed a number of times on this channel, but it's worth a quick recap. The company SSI owned the exclusive license for Advanced Dungeons & Dragons at the time. In 1988, they released a game called Pools of Radiance, and they released it in a gold box. The engine for this game went on to be called the Gold Box Engine. Although Pools of Radiance was both innovative and well-received, SSI ended up spitting out 14 gold box games over the next four years. And while on an individual level, most of these games were well liked and, you know, relatively high quality, it was just too many games. And the customers began to suffer some serious gold box fatigue. Not to mention that games technology moved at just absolute light speed during the 90s. So, you know, that four year period of time when the engine existed, that was enough time for it to become very dated. SSI was going to need a new formula going forward. To show that the new games were definitely not going to be the same as the old, they chose to depart from the Forgotten Realm setting and move on to the relatively new Dark Sun setting. Things never ended up actually going all that right for this game. It was to be released in 1992 as a very quick follow-up to the last Gold Box engine game. However, that was uh, a little too ambitious and they needed a whole extra year to finish it. The result was a flawed and buggy game that was already a little bit outdated at release. However, it was still high enough quality that it's become kind of a cult classic with a certain generation of Dark Sun fans. Dark Sun unfortunately didn't do what it set out to do. SSI never again had a very popular CRPG, the second half of their time with their license being mostly defined by dungeon crawlers like Dungeon Hack, Eye of the Beholder, and Stone Prophet. Nevertheless, Dark Sun Shattered Lands holds up as an interesting game 30 years later. And much of that has to do with the absolute bonkers setting that is Dark Sun. So to understand this particular CRPG, we're going to have to talk about the burned world of Athos. But first, if you're interested in playing any of the tabletop versions of Dark Sun, or even any other tabletop game at all in any sort of setting, then today's sponsor actually has a lot to offer you. Chepeku is a team of fantasy battle map designers that have accumulated and created a truly staggering library of maps over the years. We're talking full dungeons, singular battlefields, and set-piece locations, and more. Through Chepeku, you can access 4,000 maps for your games. They're ready to go for any virtual tabletop you use, and they're also printer-friendly if that's how you like to do this kind of stuff. And by the way, this is no static library either. This tireless team of designers offers a new map every single week with variations like day and night cycles. So how do you gain access? I mean, obviously it would be unhinged to ask you to buy 4,000 maps individually. So here's what you do. You hike on over to their Patreon, I'll put a link down below, and you sign up as a master cartographer. And you gain access to everything your heart could want. These maps are gorgeous, incredible, and varied. Okay, but wait, that's not the whole package. If you sign up at the highest tier, you also get animated battle maps that get released once a month. Chepeku actually ended up sending me an animated version of their Coatl Temple map so that I could design a Dark Sun combat encounter for my group. Yep, There's you know what? Terrain, but the water slide is free. I think this guy had the right idea. Yeah. I'm gonna Tony Hawk grind this thing down to the bottom. Pro Skater 2 or Pro Skater 3? Oh, Pro Skater 2. That's a critical success. Okay, and you make it look cool. I will give you advantage yeah. on your attack at the bottom because <laughs> you just f***ing nailed that. It was no joke, one of my favorite encounters I've run in years. These maps are so intricately put together and so just visually distinct and interesting that the combat encounters really write themselves. 
These things will absolutely immerse your players at very little extra effort on your part. The variety and imagination behind these maps is absolutely incredible. Listen, as a setting that hasn't received official support in a decade, if you would like your Dark Sun games to look as polished as other modern settings do, then you'll need all the help you can get, and Chepeku should absolutely be your first stop. You'll find the links to their Patreon and their website down below in both the description and the pinned comment. Now, let's get back to Shattered Lands. To put Dark Sun Shattered Lands into perspective, let's first talk about Dark Sun. To summarize it in a single sentence, it's Mad Max combined with Conan the Barbarian. But that's actually a terrible summary, so, you know, let's just try it again, but a little more long-winded. The world of Athos used to be a pretty typical fantasy world. The only really exceptionally weird thing about it was the prevalence of psionics. Like, everybody's psychic on Athos. But all this changed with the discovery of magic, because magic actually works a little bit different on Athos compared to other D&D planes. And by a little bit different, I mean it destroys the whole world. Magic actually drains the world around you when you use it. The one who discovered magic became a pretty much all-powerful deity. And he attempted to use this power, along with his disciples, to restore Athos to an earlier age where there were only halflings. It's the prehistory is a whole story. We're not getting into it. He and his champions ended up fighting a number of cleansing wars to accomplish this task. And yes, the cleansing wars are exactly what you're thinking they are. Never ask a woman her age, a man his salary, or Tektuk Title where all the cat girls went. Anyway, by the time they gave up, cleansing, um, the, the world was pretty much in ruins. Then these bastards who'd spent thousands of years wiping out everyone they could, uh, ended up seizing power in various city-states, thus beginning the age of the Sorcerer Kings. That's right, these maniacs from prehistory are still around and they're still in charge. And no, they haven't changed at all. Their city-states are made up of hundreds of thousands of slaves. This setting has a lot of interesting ideas to play with. The people who destroyed the climate on Athos did so because they knew that even when they did, they would still be the ones who ruled the ashes. I'm also really attracted to the story of how wizards work in Dark Sun. They're divided up mainly into two categories. The first are called Defilers, and they're sort of the main wizard that you will come across. They are called Defilers because they profane the land with their magic, and they are going to continue to destroy the world that is already destroyed. They are, however, extremely powerful when compared to wizards and sorcerers in other D&D settings. However, in Dark Sun, there is a second type of wizard called Preservers. And Preservers are driven to be uh, what you might call carbon neutral with their magic. When they draw magic out of the wildlife and especially the plants around them, they make sure that they take only just enough that they don't actually kill the things they're draining. The story really writes itself, because preservers are never going to be as powerful as defilers. So if a preserver wants to protect nature and defeat the defilers, they'll probably have to start defiling. The angst, the character arcs, it's pre-written, it's ready for you to go. All you need to do is make a preserver and just struggle with your morals. I like it. Now, with the basics of this painfully dystopian setting behind us, it's time to actually boot up the game. <laughs> okay, what? why is it so jazzy? Okay, let's set up a team. I'm gonna need a half-giant gladiator to serve as my frontliner. He shall be the big man. Hey, the big man's back! And because we have Thrykeen in this setting, I absolutely gotta have one of them. So she's gonna be like a multi-class caster ranger thing. Let's start at the beginning one last time. My name is Gwen Stacy. I was bitten by a radioactive- Mantis. Now, as I'm trying to get set up, I'm just I'm just kind of really vibing really hard with the music, and my brain's just like... You like jazz? <gasps> And obviously I'm gonna make a preserver because, I mean, I love that angst. And also, I probably do want arcane spells on my team. And listen, if I'm going to make an angsty D&D mage, uh, really there's only one name that makes sense for this guy. All right, the dream team's assembled. Let's get into the arena. How we got here isn't important, nor is it even very well explained. But here we stand nonetheless, enslaved and forced to fight. There are exactly two things to learn right here and now. The first is easy. You know, it's, it's kind of your tutorial thing. How do you fight? The second, on the other hand, is a much harder lesson. How to stay humble. It is tempting a little bit to try and showboat a bit for the arena and, you know, taunt the announcer, 
but doing so actually results in them unleashing just absurdly high-powered monsters into the arena to devour you. The takeaway should be clear. You're at rock bottom, and you're only still alive because they're going easy on you. But they're not going to forever. When the fight's done, you get brought to the slave pens, and you have some time to explore and meet your peers. There are ample opportunities for side quests and many different possibilities to escape. Curiously, the game never actually gives you an objective here, but it doesn't really need to either. I mean, you obviously want to escape. They're not gonna let you out of here through your own merit. What, you've watched gladiator movies and think you can earn your way out? Well, the game actually puts a veteran gladiator, a champion gladiator in here, and he's still walking around. They won't let him go. There's also a chef in here who's absolutely proven his worth, and they're still keeping him in the pits as well. So no matter what, no matter how good you are, they ain't letting you go. Besides that, the gameplay diegetically pushes you to need to escape anyway. During your time here as a gladiator, the fights will be getting progressively harder with each round. And if your party isn't min-maxed flawlessly, then eventually the arena will kill you and you'll end up getting softlocked. It's escape or it's die an unknown gladiator. The ways to get out of this place are many, and some are easier than others. I chose to bide my time and grab as much EXP as I could from side quests and the easier arena fights. I learned a lot about the situation I was in. These were the slave pits of the most warlike city, Draj, ruled over by the sorcerer king Tektuktitle, you know, he who purged the cat girls. Apparently, out in the dunes past the city's authority, there's a number of scattered villages made up of free people living beyond the tyranny of Draj. This was good news, because it's nice to know that I actually have somewhere to escape to. Eventually, the leader of one of the gangs in the arena asked me for help with an escape plan. He would arrange for his gang to square off against me in the arena, and then we'd both make a break for a secret way out and fight the guards while they were scattered and disorganized. It was still pretty tricky to pull off, and I was worried for a moment there that I'd soft-locked myself by building a party that wasn't up to snuff, but in the end, we did make it out, and we got into the sewers. Having finished the introduction area, I think this is as good a place as any to stop, and let's talk about the presentational aspects of this game. Look, most of the stuff here is well done, it's nice, it's high enough quality for its time, but in the end, I don't know, it just doesn't look or sound like Dark Sun. Graphically speaking, it looks pretty cartoony. Although you could conceivably blame this problem on the tech of 1992 and 1993, I actually think this is more of an art direction problem. Ultima The Black Gate is a game that Shattered Lands ends up getting compared to a lot, and although The Dark Gate also looks kind of cartoony, it's actually a little bit more serious looking in my opinion. And it's also not marketing itself as like a grimdark game. If Shattered Lands was trying to look like less of a cartoon than Black Gate, they failed. All they really succeeded at doing was having the graphics look like muddier and browner. I'm not going to oversell it here because Shattered Lands was always intended to be kind of a package deal with the sequel, Wake of the Ravager, and I am told that Wake of the Ravager has significantly better graphics. Uh, so, you know, Shattered Lands doesn't look that great, doesn't look too much like Dark Sun. Uh, the sequel may fix it. We'll see. Conclusion, Dark Sun doesn't look like Dark Sun unless you kind of blur your eyes and you only look at the color palette. And while the game doesn't look very much like Dark Sun, it sounds like Dark Sun even less. Though there are a few tracks that do kind of hit right. But these tracks are kinda overwhelmed by all the little jazzy bops that make up the bulk of your playtime. I am not gonna lie, this soundtrack totally fucking bangs. It's so upbeat, it's fun, but like, 
Dark Sun isn't upbeat and fun. It, this is definitely a case of being the right soundtrack for the wrong game. Returning to the story, the sewer is occupied with a trio of feuding rat clans, and we have to navigate through their conflicts if we wish to get help finding our way above ground. One of the clans possesses a council of ghostly elders who do know the way out, but we're not permitted to speak with them unless we help the clan find the chieftain's missing daughter. This daughter was apparently taken by the second of the three clans. Confronting this other chieftain reveals that he did steal the girl, but it was in exchange for food from the third rat clan, who are under the direct sway of Tektuktitle in a sort of cult. After fighting our way through the rat cultists, we rescue the daughter, but she informs us that a vast horde of cult rats are headed to kill her father in the name of Tektuktitle. We race back and aid in the defense, being granted an audience with the wise ghostly rats as a reward. We're given the ultimate tool for navigating the tunnels, a long stick. It can open a wizard's lair, uh, but this is kind of a death sentence until we're higher level. But more importantly, we get a lever so that we can activate all the broken cranks in the area. And using that, we're able to make our way to the surface. Now, we aren't technically out of Draj yet. A combination of irrigation, resource hoarding, and the sorcerer's might of Tektuktitle allows the city-state to be surrounded by vast farming fields that produce nearly limitless supplies of food for the city. Negotiating with some of the slaves, we're able to stage an escape out into the desert after dispatching a few guards. Finally, we're free. Though that's not to say we're safe. Athos is full of the nastiest kind of monsters in between the city-states, so we race north until we find one of these free villages that we were previously told about. The locals call it Teaquetzal, and they're happy to harbor a band of escaped gladiators like us. In fact, our coming was apparently prophesied by a halfling visionary, who claims we're about to defeat the armies of Draj on behalf of the free people. Oh yeah, did you not hear? Draj is preparing a vast army to surge out into the waste and wipe out all of these free villages. And you know, capture their inhabitants as slaves. Well, free village or not, we're not really going to be able to rest on our laurels here. We speak to the town's leadership, which appears to be going through a bit of a power struggle. The mayor is a tough old warrior who's a real community-oriented kind of guy. Downside is he's pretty simple-minded and doesn't really know what to do to make the village prosper. His lieutenant is very much the opposite kind of man. Selfish, decidedly unsuited for combat, and constantly sneering down his nose at most of the community. On the other hand, he's kind of a genius at economics and civil engineering. Although a violent clash between them seems inevitable one day, uh, it doesn't happen in this game as far as I was able to find, and thus far the arrangement has gone quite well for Tea Quetzal. The mayor has kept the town safe and united, while the lieutenant has helped it prosper like never before. The mayor pledges to raise their forces to defeat Draj, and sends our party off to find more free villages to join an alliance to push back the invaders. Long term, there's really nowhere that's going to be safe for us to settle down, asides from these desert towns, and I mean we can't keep running forever, so we pledge to help. We set off once more into the unknown in search of allies. But this time, with friends at our backs, our bags full of items purchased from the Tea Quetzal market, and our characters nicely leveled up, we're now actually strong enough to give as good as we get in the world of Dark Sun, and we've got a pretty good shot at squaring off against virtually any creature we stumble across in the wasteland. Our characters have already been on quite a journey in terms of powering up compared to when we began as doomed gladiators in the arena. It's that classic D&D vibe. You start out nearly helpless, but by the end, you're kind of unstoppable. Shattered Lands is clearly dated in a ton of ways, but for this and many other reasons, it's clearly recognizable when compared to modern isometric RPGs like Pillars of Eternity, Divinity, or Owlcat's Pathfinder games. This is the same sort of game as those, minus about 30 years of quality of life changes. Once you're past those early barriers, this game feels very familiar to get lost in. But let's be real, I missed those quality of life changes a lot, and you probably will too. If you're an isometric CRPG fiend and you're absolutely starving for content, you could consider playing Shattered Lands, but for anyone else, Oh man, I mean, it's probably too dated to be worth it. But, you know, since we're here talking gameplay anyway, let's take a second to address the game balance. And let me tell you, it's wild. 
Half Giants, for example, are pretty much mandatory to have on your team. Not only do they have incredible amounts of health compared to everyone else, they also have a high strength cap, letting them deal more damage than the rest of your party combined. Let me tell you, I am glad I had the big man on my side. By the end of the game, my strategy was largely just to have my entire team use all their spells to buff up the big man and then let him rampage through the enemy forces. Bring back that fucking Quaaludes! Now, compared to your standard D&D setup, Dark Sun is a world that recontextualizes a lot of things and significantly alters the classes. Clerics actually get hit the hardest by this. The class was kind of gutted. Future editions would balance it better, but Shattered Lens is not based on those editions. You'll notice that in Dark Sun, there actually aren't any gods. There's some fantasy metaphysics going on here about Athos being surrounded by a weird second plane called the Grey that's like a thick, soupy molasses, and it makes interplanar travel and contact between the outer planes really difficult. Uh, point is, no gods on Athos. All the clerics on Athos instead get their powers from an element that they pledge themselves to, as well as extra powers that they get from the cosmos themselves. In practice, the cosmic spell are just the normal spell list that clerics get, but they only get those spells until they've reached third level cleric spells. After that, all of their magic will be a very limited number of spells themed around their chosen element. Where most everybody else gets things added to their class in this setting, clerics pretty much get gutted. Don't make the same mistake I did. I had Mantis Gwen as a cleric. Instead, you should pick druids. They get a lot of those missing cleric spells. There's also the addition of some new classes. The gladiator I found to be quite interesting. It's a slightly better version of the fighter class, but the downside being that it levels up more slowly and it also can't multi-class. More importantly though, we have psionics and the psionic class. Every individual on Athos has some level of psionic talent. So when you create your characters, you pick a psionic school for them and they can collect a small number of powers. These powers are then cast by using your Psy points, which are basically a mana pool. The Scion class, however, gets all three schools of psionic powers and gets a comparatively enormous pool of Psy points to work with each day. With psionic powers being so powerful for so many different playstyles, for most characters you'll end up having to ask yourself, why am I not multi-classing this character into being a Scion? Overall, for people who are generally fans of Dungeons & Dragons, Dark Sun is this neat little grab bag of class changes and content that makes the rules and class setup feel fresh again. There was a lot of variety in terms of what you could do with your party, especially compared to other AD&D video games from the early 90s. I kept feeling my restart-itis flare up actually, just wanting to go from the beginning and try new class combinations and stuff. Thankfully though, I stopped myself from restarting, mostly through a combination of, uh, you know, deadlines for this video and also knowing I would get a second shot at building a party in the sequel. The game design wasn't all combat, however. In fact, critics at the time praised how much effort Dark Sun put into giving you options to avoid getting into combat. There are so many options to talk things through, problem solve, and generally just avoid being a murder fiend. Unfortunately, the mechanics in some ways don't really complement the design focus. This isn't a Shattered Lands problem so much as it is a D&D &D problem in general. Enemies are big ol' pinatas full of loot and XP, just waiting for you to crack open. Solving problems without violence usually leaves you both poorer and lower level than if you had just attacked. Shattered Lands does make an effort to alleviate this somewhat with an XP reward for completing quests and objectives, and this works well enough for quests, but when it comes to random encounters you'll find out here, uh, it's rarely worth it compared to just violently crashing through the wastes. Still, just use your brain. Don't attack everyone on sight, but if you find yourself talking to a bunch of slavers demanding payment for human lives, I mean, yeah, just, just kill them. Quests are worth your time, negotiations rarely are not. Go for the throat. Regardless of how violently you choose to play, the level cap is actually pretty easy to hit. My gladiator and my preserver were both single classed and they were maxed out three quarters of the way into the game. My multi-class characters were getting pretty close to the cap in the end and I still had plenty of unfinished side quests. So there's plenty of opportunity to completely fill out your party. Returning to these quests in question, we're tasked with finding 
finding allies around Draj. And to do so, we have to wander the desert in search of signs of civilization. It's a task that sounds bleak and grim, but the music has other ideas. As we wander and meet various NPCs, we find a number of people who believe we're part of the Veiled Alliance due to our escape from Draj. When we ask what the Veiled Alliance is, they pretty much universally go, Oh, you don't know who the Veiled Alliance is? Yeah, me neither, wink wink. It's unhelpful, and we never actually do end up learning much about the Veiled Alliance. Word is this is kind of a setup for the sequel, so just remember there's a couple mysteries in this game that don't get solved in the first rendition. The game isn't linear, but the first village I stumbled across was called Gedron and it's the first taste we get of the actual power of the Defilers in Dark Sun. The entire village has been enthralled by a sorcerer named Virmius, who keeps the villagers around as playthings. The only person who's been spared this fate is a local preserver who might be immune. The preserver suggests that you accept Virmius' demands in exchange for freeing the village. She also tells us that she has a druid sister who went north, so we make a mental note to look out for her later. Virmius' demands mostly amount to requesting a pair of fragments of a magical statue. I get them from some side quests, and he releases the villagers. He appears to us in person, taunting us to strike him down if we so wish. And, uh, yeah, I do, thanks. This was apparently a trap. For killing him is the final thing he required to transfer his mind into the statue we foolishly brought him. Now, the game tells us, Virmius is unstoppable. With all the powers of a defiler and the body of a stone golem, there are few things on Athos that could hope to defeat him. This is the big man, the voice, the voice of the people. <laughs> Rora seven fourteen. Anyway, Vermius is dealt with, and the villagers are free once again. I asked the village to join the alliance, but there's a problem with that. While the village was enthralled, Vermius sold all the guards as slaves. I hate these defiling fucking bastards so much. While I hunt the slaves down, I find the preserver's sister and prevent her from being sacrificed to a giant monster. You know, it's just important to support your homies like that. After this, we make our way over to the slavers and kill them. Remember, it's not murder if they're slavers. And Gedrin approves of our action, choosing to join my alliance against Raj. From here, it's now time to wander the desert once more and side quest until we find another village. This time we stumble across Sedrittle Village. We run interference and protect the town from the wyverns and the bandits that are wrangling them. The village elder thanks us, but absolutely can't help with any form of alliance until the threat is neutralized completely. The wyverns are being sent here by a bandit gang in a nearby castle. A dwarf helps us locate the secret entrance, and we descend to Undermountain. No, no, oh, God, please no, not Undermountain, not again. Okay, okay, don't worry, it's not that Undermountain, it's not that game. I still have fucking nightmares, I swear to God. Anyway, down here in Dark Sun's Undermountain, there's a war brewing between the psionically linked Mind Home and the Dark Spiders. And no, the Dark Spiders, that's not like a gang name, they're literally just Dark Spiders. Peace is possible, however, and an outcast from the Mind Home tells us that the aggression of the otherwise intelligent spiders is mainly due to a curse that has been placed upon them. Investigating further, there is indeed merit to this idea. A pair of ancient defilers, brother and sister to each other, came here in a past age to take control of the castle. Although the sister struck first to seal away her brother and take the castle for herself, the brother cursed his treacherous sibling and her lackeys with eternal undeath trapped within the halls above. Upon continuing and meeting the Spider Queen, we are asked to investigate and destroy the strange spore cloud that has been driving spiders to lose their minds in anger. Her sending us to accomplish this, however, is somewhat insincere. The Queen apparently sends adventurers to the spore hallways so that she doesn't have to murder us herself. However, upon fixing the problem and rescuing a number of ravenous spiders, the Queen sends her guards to slay us. The Prince actually intervenes on our behalf beginning a battle for control over the spider brood. We back the prince and slay the queen. 
A trade deal is then established between the spiders and the Mind Home, bringing peace to Undermountain. Thankful for our efforts, the Mind Home helps us sneak into the Wyvern Castle above. It's pretty much what it says on the tin. Lots of banditos and wyverinos. We clear it out without much trouble. Though, I mean, fuck this guy if you know you know. There's also a ton of trapped servants of the Sister Defiler. They would all like help ending the curse, thank you very much, but there's nothing we can actually do for them at this exact moment. On the top floor, we have help free a trapped druid. He asks us to slay the bandit leader and take the wyvern staff. Once delivered to him, he will return the wyverns to their natural state. You know, terrifying predators instead of raging war beasts. Upgrades, people! Upgrades! In exchange, he offers to help us slay the Defiler and end the curse. The bandit leader is naturally no match for the big man from Brooklyn, and soon the druid has his staff. And we have a magical air potion that will sweep the Defiler's soul into the afterlife. A cheeky little fight later, and she's downed, bragging as she dies about how she's definitely gonna be back here in a second. But what she doesn't expect is that we're about to drink some carbonated water. Downstairs, the zombies are happy to be free, and we drink some more of this LaCroix to break the seals that hold them in place. Returning back to Sidriddle Village, handing in the quest here actually ends up triggering the ending once we step foot in Tea Quetzal again, so I decide to do a few more side quests first, including a big one about an immortal demon summoning guy. And then, after all that's done, I go tell the Sidriddle Elder that I'm done. She and her guards pledge to join my army. And now there's just a long walk back to Taya Quetzal to think about how far we've come. Oh, they used to have cigarette commercials. The guy used to say I'd walk a mile for a camel. Well, let me tell all you young people out there, the big man would walk 20 miles for a quaalude, let me tell you. <laughs> back in the village, the armies have assembled and are ready to face down Draj, with us leading the vanguard. Tektuk Title's army, however, is delayed by a storm which has dredged up an ancient ruin. We have a chance to explore this ruin before the battle, hoping for one final bit of help in our fight. The ruins are still awash with the ghosts of their former inhabitants, as well as the creatures they brought here from a distant plane. These strange sentient horrors are called Sirlons, and they came here offering their ancient knowledge in exchange for a genie lamp in possession of the king. The king's advisor believed that the Sirlons had cruel intent and ended up slaying the king. With a wish from the genie, he wished that the evil in the city would be sealed away forever. Unfortunately, I mean, as we all no, wish magic is pretty tricky, and it turns out that nobody was considered to be free of evil, and so the entire city came to be buried. Now look, given the choice between the advisor and the Sirlons, I mean, I'm a simple man. When I see scheming untrustworthy creatures from other dimensions attempting to obtain wish magic that will allow them to pull thousands of their writhing tentacled brethren into our dimension, I mean, I rev up my chainsaw and I get cleaning house. Truly. Look, I did them a favor, they're better off. Do these eldritch idiots really think that Athos of all places is a good dimension to invade? I get my hands on the genie, and I get some wishes to make the final battle easier. The ghosts in the city join my army, so that's one wish. I get a cloned version of the most powerful magic sword in the game, so that's two wishes. And then, I mean, we get healed, which may be kind of a lame wish, but it was incredibly needed because there was nowhere to rest and we absolutely needed our strength for the final battle. Speaking of that final battle... <sighs> okay, uh, I assume a lot of vets who played this game back in the day, there's probably a fair number of you guys who clicked on this video explicitly just to see some guy get his ass kicked by this infamous encounter. And yeah, okay, yeah, sure, have your fun, laugh it up, okay? This, this encounter, it, it fucked me up, okay? I got, I, I fucking died so many times, it took me hours to complete this thing. You're up against, like, 25 level 12s, meanwhile, your level cap is 9. It's rough out there, okay? I've not been left with this level of despair from a video game since frickin' Space Hulk. Anyway, final battle was eventually defeated by a mixture of fireballs and good luck. The Draj invasion is defeated, and the villages continue to scrape out an existence beyond the reach of the Sorcerer Kings. Though Tektuk Title is still alive, so hold on to your catgirls. The game rewards you with a powerful magic sword, but 
not much to do with it other than clear up remaining side quests. You can, I am told, export your party to the second game, so this sword doesn't necessarily truly go to waste. Being that the game was obviously intended to be tightly entwined with the second game, I am going to avoid being excessively definitive here. Dark Sun Shattered Lands was a fun little romp, albeit I'm left feeling like it wasn't a great adaptation of the source material. I already covered the presentation's failure to land the dark tone of the setting, but I mostly feel like that was true for the whole game. The gladiator pits did feel correct, in fact I would say they were the highlight of the game for me, but once we got into the world, I mean everything just felt like regular D&D but with a brown color palette. If it wasn't for defilers being presented so well, I mean this probably wouldn't have even felt very much like Dark Sun at all. But I mean, oh man, those defilers. We got small fry defilers, massively powerful defilers, and defilers so mighty they're close to being demigods. Beyond that, according to people online who know more about the setting than I do, there appear to be a ton of lore problems in Shattered Lands. It feels like there were a few people who actually understood Dark Sun on the team, but not enough of them. And they certainly weren't calling the shots. Anyway, once again, I don't want to harp on this thing too much until we get to part two, Wake of the Ravager. Though, uh, <laughs> that one has a reputation of being a bit of a buggy mess, so I mean, wish me luck, you guys. I hope to catch all of you in the next one. And if you haven't already, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. Or check out some of the neat goodies I offer on Patreon. It's such a big help, and you'll also receive perks like video previews, early access to content, and we might even start doing a patron movie night once a month. Hope to see a few of you guys there. Cheers everybody, and we'll see ya in Wake of the Ravager.